Oh, that's better than what I want. Hey, no, no, no. Let me try on which, because that wasn't the English logic. But other people will not have that. Whoa, what's up? Can you, do you have a contact for?
Okay, good morning. Good morning. You guys made it. Good morning, everyone. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, welcome. Um, thank you for all of you for being on time. I understand you were here since eight o'clock, so I'm glad you were able to uh, meet some of our student leaders. Um, so I'd like to welcome you to uh, Hawaii Pacific Neuroscience and Hawaii's first uh, Myasthenia Gravis Symposium. Um, so uh, thank you for being part of the symposium as well. Uh, this is the really the first inaugural symposium for Hawaii for Myasthenia Gravis uh, to address unmet needs in Myasthenia Gravis and improving Myasthenia Gravis care in Hawaii and the Pacific. Uh, I was told that we have about 70 people registered for the symposium. So uh, thank you for everyone who registered, uh, wherever you're coming from. We have people coming from the mainland. Uh, thank you for flying all the way from the mainland to, to be with us. So um, on behalf of uh, uh, Mastia Graves Foundation, President and CEO, Samantha Masterson, and um, the meeting for planning this symposium. I uh, would like to welcome you. Uh, symposium sponsored by the Center for Rare Neurological Diseases at Hawaii Pacific Neuroscience. So uh, we have lots to cover. Um, this, I know the students are excited and you want to do your presentation and all that, but we're going to get through the symposium first. And this is will be a great way for you to also uh, uh, see how a neuroscience symposium runs. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about myasthenia gravis because we're going to have the expert here, uh, uh, Meredith from the Myasthenia Gravis Foundation will be here, and also uh, Dr. Richard Nowak, uh, who is a uh, world famous neurologist uh, at Yale, will also be on Zoom uh, speaking to you about myasthenia gravis foundation. So, uh, my myasthenia gravis. So I wouldn't embarrass myself by uh, talking about myasthenia gravis. So, um, but the purpose of uh, next slide. But the purpose of the Center for Rare Neurological Diseases is uh, several fold, three folds, is to provide hope through clinical research. And that's what we do here. And uh, many of you are actually part of the clinical research that we're doing uh, with Dr. Direct, Dr. Perzana. And um, our goal is to bring research to Hawaii and the Pacific. So our uh, patients from our island doesn't have to travel to the mainland. The second goal is to uh, provide compassionate care. Um, we've got to make sure it's compassionate uh, care to the patients affected by rare neurological diseases like myasthenia gravis. So uh, perhaps you know of somebody with this disease or a rare. So we're very passionate about providing care to the patients with rare because they're often ignored and underdiagnosed and undertreated. So our goal is to uh, provide care for these patients. Uh, the third fold is what we're doing today uh, to provide education uh, on this rare diseases and awareness uh, for public and medical community for you guys. So uh, with that, uh, we're gonna go to the next slide. And let me see what we're doing next. So the symposium is broken up into um, two sessions. So in the morning plenary session, we're going to have uh, our keynote speaker, Dr. Noah from Yale. Uh, and then for, uh, after Meredith from Myasthenia Gravis Foundation. Then we're going to go into break at about 11, 15. Uh, before that, we're going to have Dr. Abramowitz uh, talk about uh, our own neurologist and psychiatrist from Hawaii, talk about uh, uh, depression, anxiety, in Myasthenia Gravis Foundation. And then after that, we're going to go into break at about 11, 15. Uh, that time, don't run after the restroom, please. Okay, we're going to take a group picture right out here. Uh, and then the med medical students, please have your white coat with you. We're going to take a group picture with your white coat. And then um, the students and the medical students, uh, your session will be really important in the afternoon scientific session. 
where we will begin with the, uh, uh, we're gonna do the next slide, I believe. So here again, it is the morning session. We'll start up with Meredith uh, from my senior graduate foundation of America. And uh, she's gonna talk to us about uh, patient care and resources and what MGFA is about. And then followed by Dr. Richard Nowak's uh, keynote address. And then followed by Dr. Abramowitz's uh, management anxiety and mood disorders. Next slide. And in the afternoon session, uh, we'll start off with the orientation for the interns. Uh, those of you who are new to our uh, Brain Research Innovation Translation Labs uh, internship. Uh, so congratulations for getting accepted into the internship. And then uh, after that, we'll followed by the Medical Student Springs Neuroscience Competition. Uh, next slide. So during the, your orientation, uh, Dr. Burgess will be here. Uh, who is the uh, Dean of Students, Director of Student Affairs at Jackson. And then forward, we're going to introduce your 2023 uh, Brittle Project Leaders uh, Award, uh, Julian Anson uh, will be here. Uh, we'll introduce them. And then you're going to hear from Dr. Jason Burek, uh, Academic Note Director, uh, who is going to talk to you a little bit about uh, doing research, neuroscience research. Uh, so he's going to tell you what to do and what not to do. Uh, there are things that we shouldn't do. So, and then we're going to have Dr. Enrique Corzana, our publication director. Dr. Corzana, maybe I didn't tell you this, but you're going to speak also about uh, getting your work published. Yeah, yes, yeah. So, but he's always, he's always rating. So he's giving for that. Yeah, so he's going to talk to you about uh, why we're doing this and how to, how to get your research published. And then we actually do have a surprise guest speaker that's going to show up sometime in the afternoon. Not sure what time he will show up, but when he shows up, we're going to stop the student presentation and we're going to let him speak. Uh, it, it, it's not it's not a celebrity, don't worry. Uh, it, it, it will be very, very good. Uh, okay. So last but not least, uh, I'd like to thank our sponsors, uh, UCB, Telus, Argenix, and Credo for making this symposium possible. Thank you uh, for joining us and investing in the community and investing in our students and uh, physicians and medical community in the future of um, uh, neuroscience care in Hawaii. So uh, can we just give them a round of applause? I think they're all right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, without further delay, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Meredith Connor, uh, who is the um, uh, Vice President of Patient Engagement and Advocacy and Policy at Mass and Graduate Foundation of America. Uh, she has a great story, by the way, to, uh, on how she got involved in uh, MGFA. So uh, I won't take away her thunder. I'll let, I'll let her tell you the story herself. Uh, Mary Dad, are you there with us? Yes. Hi, Dr. Liao. Can you all hear me okay? Can you? Can you hear me, Dr. Liao? Yes, I can hear you. I just want to make sure the people in the back can hear Mary Dash. Okay. Do you want me to go ahead and share my screen? Is that? Yes, please. Yes, sure. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, great. Here, it's loading, so give it a second. That is not what I want. Give me one second. Okay, can everybody see my screen? I don't think I can hear the audience, so whoever's in charge, can you see my screen okay? Give us one second, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Just setting some things up. Sure, no problem. Okay. 
Okay, I think we're good to go. Okay, you can see my screen. Everybody good? Yes. Okay, great. Well, uh, good morning to you all. It's the afternoon for me, but good morning to each and every one of you. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here and uh, to speak on behalf of the Myasthenia Gravis Foundation of America. Um, my name is Meredith O'Connor. Uh, as Dr. Liao mentioned, I am the Assistant Vice President of Patient Engagement Advocacy and Policy here at the MGFA. And while relatively new to this particular role, um, I am not new to myasthenia gravis. I actually have the diagnosis and have had MG for almost 20 years now. So um, I've been committed to advocating for my community um, ever since. So um, this is not only just like a very professional endeavor, but it's very personal to me. So um, again, thank you. It's a, it's a privilege to be here with all of you. Um, before I get started and jump into everything, I also like to um, just set the stage a little bit about how far the MGFA has come um, since it's been established. So it was established around approximately 70 plus years ago, um, but it wasn't until six years ago that um, that we actually had a staff conducting the operations. We're having a little problem with the audio. If you just give us one second so we can make sure everyone um, can hear you. Yes. Sure. All right, thank you. thank you. Meredith, could you try to say something again, please? Sure. MGFA, MGFA. Okay, we're good to go. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Um, okay. Where did I leave off? Okay. So yeah. So what I was mentioning is that although you know um, it was established quite some time ago, it wasn't until about I guess six years ago that we actually had a staff uh, within MGFA. So it started out small. It was um, started out with two employees, and we now have grown to um, a team of thirteen. So we've essentially doubled in size and almost quadrupled the amount of research we fund. So. We always like to tell people that while it was established, you know, a few decades ago, we still consider ourselves a very young and green organization, right? There's still just so much work to be done on behalf of this community, and we are working every day um, towards uh, a cure for MG. So let's jump right into it. So the mission and vision of the MGFA. Um, so of course we all know that the importance, how important the mission and vision is to an organization, right? Um, and our mission at the MGFA is to create meaningful connections, enhance the lives of those impacted by MG, to improve the quality of care uh, that currently exists, and of course, to find a cure for MG. Now, it may sound obvious, but um, we envision a world without MG. But the mission and vision is not something we take lightly. It's actually um, very important to us because it all started out with a mom on a mission. And that mom was Jane Ellsworth. So to give you some historical context, uh, like I said, Jane Ellsworth was the mother, mother of a daughter named Pat who was diagnosed with myasthenia gravis. And at the time, which was 1952, there was very limited to no information about this disease. And you can imagine you know, put yourself in the shoes of the mother and daughter just being diagnosed with this rare neuromuscular disease and not knowing much. So what did Jane set out to do? She set out to uh, find a world without MG, essentially. So how did she do that? Well, she made connections with uh, healthcare providers um, and those who were fully immersed in uh, the MG environment at the time. Uh, created and built awareness around a disease that really not many people knew even existed, and to ultimately provide education to those in and without outside the community um, so that we could better understand myasthenia gravis. So the MGFA's Bequest Society, in, in efforts to honor their legacy, um, it's been named in honor of the Ellsworth family. So as you know, as you can probably tell, the mission and vision is just incredibly important and significant to us. So who are we today though? 
The Myasthenia Gravis Foundation of America is the largest leading patient advocacy organization solely dedicated to finding a cure and improved treatments for the rare neuromuscular disease Myasthenia Gravis. But what makes us different? How do we differentiate ourselves um, amongst all the other organizations? So we have the widest, widest reach to drive awareness across the country. We serve as the convener for MG clinical and scientific communities, bringing people together to ultimately engage and educate one another um, around the latest findings of MG. We are the premier source of information and education for patients um, and their families. So uh, ultimately we wanna be able to uh, make sure that our the patients that live in this that are living with MG and the networks that um, surround them are fully informed. We have a formal uh, grant funding process that drives the non-biased selection of grant funding opportunities directed at the most promising research uh, uh, within MG. We are the only national organization uh, that provides support groups so that people with MG can foster relationships and uh, connect and support one another along their journey. And lastly, we utilize an external medical and scientific advisory council that helps guide us in making informed decisions regarding uh, healthcare as it pertains to MG. But none of this would be made possible um, without, if we didn't adhere to the values uh, in which we uphold. So the values we value, at the MGFA, we value respect, excellence, transparency, collaboration, and continuous improvement. Now, we recognize that everyone comes from a diverse background, right? And we choose to embrace those differences. Um, and in doing so, that allows us, take, allows us to take a dignified ethical approach in our service delivery. We strive for excellence and everything that we do. And we hold ourselves accountable by prioritizing access to the finest and most promising research, support, resources, and education. We are considered the premier trusted resource and we have to build that trust and that trust is built upon transparency and open dialogue. And we know that we cannot make positive change without the continued collaboration with other people and organizations working together to make an informed approach um, in how we model our organization. And of course, every organization faces its challenges, but we face those challenges with creativity, strategy, and remain open-minded in efforts to grow from them. So how do we deliver on that mission? Well, how do we make sure that you know, this organization is doing what it's it's saying that they're going to do and actually delivering on that mission, right? Um, it's understanding what the community needs and wants and addressing those unmet needs. So what we have found is that this community of patients, providers, caregivers, um, all those within the, the MG community um, really look to prioritize education, research, advocacy, and awareness. So we have support groups, as I mentioned, all across the country and programming that allows those with perhaps maybe a specific identity or a shared characteristic to connect with one another and learn from each other, all of which are facilitated by uh, trained uh, support group leaders and volunteers within our community. We have a state-of-the-art online community. If you haven't been able to see this, I encourage you to go check it out. It is an incredible virtual reality where uh, patients and community stakeholders can sign up at no cost to them, and they can obtain resources and chat and interact with one another, um, learn about the latest research, and educate themselves with all the content and material we've curated over the years. We host a variety of community events that help patients and their loved ones maintain awareness around the latest in MG, become educated on the variety of tools and resources on both a local and national level to aid them in managing, in their, managing their MG. We always wanna make sure patients have the tools they need to be their best own advocate, right? So how do we do that? Well, in addition to all the things I've mentioned, we have also built a patient registry and mobile app. Um, these tools help patients better manage their own disease, but continue to advance 
uh, the care for those um, in the future living with rare disease. We partner with organizations and collaborate on different initiatives that patients are so that patients are supported beyond their medical diagnosis. So, so organizations like NORD, Every Life Foundation, Can Foundation, we will always work together and collaborate with one another to make sure that patients are fully informed, engaged, and have the right tools that they need to live their best lives. But we also know that our community is goes beyond MG patients, right? Our community, um, a lot of it's comprised of physicians, uh, clinicians, researchers, medical students, um, all like yourselves, dedicated to, dedicated to supporting those with myasthenia gravis. So we have our Partners in Care program. It's a phenomenal program um, that provides those who are experts within the field a place where patients can actually find um, can search into who is in their area or around the country that is providing the best care for MG. Uh, healthcare providers and researchers within MG Focus are also invited to participate in all of our events, including our international conference, um, where they can learn from one another and advance the care management and understanding of this disease. We continue to move the needle by funding the most promising research and giving our researchers an opportunity not only to improve the lives of those living with MG, but give them a place where they can, where they can step closer to a cure for MG. So all in all, I know that was a quick MGFA 101, but um, I just wanted to leave you with this. We at the MGFA are working every single day to help MG patients no matter where they are in their journey, whether they are in the process of getting diagnosed or have had this disease for decades, we meet people where they're at, right? And we focus on how we can optimize um, their life with MG. You know, MG used to be considered a deadly disease or just a very devastating disease. But um, if we continue to research and provide greater treatment options, give people equitable opportunities to access comprehensive healthcare with the appropriate tools and resources and arm them with a strong support system, um, lives can change for the better. And we hope you will continue to join us in supporting those uh, impacted by myasthenia gravis. So thank you for your attention and time. Again, it's truly an honor and a privilege and I look forward to collaborating in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Meredith. And I remember that uh, years ago uh, when I saw an MG patient, a um, Steve Graves patient, and um, uh, she was a lady from Waimanalo. And it took uh, years to even get the diagnosis because it is a rare disease and not often um, she had the wrong diagnosis for years. Uh, that's number one. So, um, and the second is once the diagnosis was made, uh, it was so difficult to find the right treatment. The, 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 there was such a paucity of information, you know, for, for my patient. And um, so uh, personally, I, uh, I appreciate uh, the effort of a uh, support group like MGFA, um, you know, and since then we have uh, uh, many patients that have uh, made the diagnosis. And um, I, I uh, personally, I, I value a lot uh, what MGFA and what Meredith, what your organization is doing. So um, uh, thank you. Thank you on behalf of the patients and the medical community for what you do. I know you can't see me, but uh, here I am. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you, Dr. Liao. Um, yeah. Thank you for saying that. We are um, very proud of the work that we've done and continue to do, but we wouldn't have been able to do it without partners like yourselves. And, and so we're, um, we're just continuing to work on behalf of this community, my community, um, every single day. So thank you. Thank you so much. And you have a great story. Did you did you share it earlier? And, and uh, Sure. I, I'm happy to do a quick, hey, sure, if please. there's time, if there's time. Yeah, always time for stories. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll... Stories here in Hawaii. <laughs> well, I'll give a, a, a brief, a uh, Brief intro to my story. So as I told you all, I have the diagnosis. I was diagnosed in 2005 at just the young age of 13 years old. Um, I was misdiagnosed for about two plus years. 
Um, and during that time, I had all the typical symptoms that you would see with myasthenia gravis. So trouble chewing, swallowing, smiling, um, difficulty with slurred speech. I had a nasal tinge to my voice, had weakness in my arms and legs. Now, these symptoms over the course of those two years were very um, fluctuating. You know, sometimes it would be fine. Other times it would be, you know, really, really debilitating. But by the end of that two year uh, mark, I was really, really, you know, holding on to hope at that point, right? I, I, I was really sick um, and I was diagnosed with, um, many people would say it was all in my head. But I was making this up for attention. Um, I was diagnosed with just generalized allergies. Um, so various things of that nature. And, and, you know, I always, people always ask, you know, why did it take so long or, you know, and I think the rare aspect of this disorder definitely contributed to the misdiagnosis and the long diagnostic odyssey. I also believe that me being a child diagnosed with this rare disease um, was um, incredibly rare at the time. And so, um, you know, once I finally received a diagnosis, actually a, a neurologist said I had textbook case myasthenia and it was just the validation I needed to hear because, you know, I would tell everyone all these symptoms that I had and no one would believe me. I mean, my family did, but they didn't know what it was. And, um, you know, it, it, was, it was just this incredible sense of validation and hope um, instilled with me. So my life changed, changed that day forever. So, um, you know, I went through all the typical treatments that you usually see with a myasthenia gravis diagnosis. They started me on mestinon, um, and then I went, and then I was on prednisone and also uh, was hospitalized, <clears throat> excuse me, to receive the thymectomy, removal of your thymus, and uh, to prep me for surgery. So I was strong enough, went through IVIG and plasmapheresis. Um, since then, I've been um, on a, I've been, I did the, uh, prednisone therapy where I take it two days out of the week actually to eliminate some of those side effects that you typically see with steroids. <clears throat> now I'm on a very low dose, but it, it took over the course of 15 years to get me to be on a low dose. I was very on very high doses of prednisone. And it wasn't really until 2020 that I had an exacerbation. Um, my uh, blurry vision and double vision and droopy eyelids came back. And that was incredibly scary because as you know, with myasthenia, things can turn relatively quickly. And so um, I was very scared because I knew what could happen. And so right away, I called my doctor. This was in the midst of, or right at the cusp of the pandemic. And they were talking about putting me on IVIG and I was very, didn't want to go to the hospital and, you know, with COVID and everything. And so what we ended up deciding is putting me on subcutaneous immunoglobulin therapy. So um, I administer that. It started as every week. Um, I was doing well on that, but slowly switched to every other week. And now I'm doing every two weeks so, or every three weeks, excuse me. Um, so I'm, I'm feeling very strong. I'm very healthy. I would say my disease is very well managed. The thing I struggle with the most is fatigue, um, the fluctuating fatigue and energy levels that, um, that I have are, it's, it's an everyday occurrence. And the, the thing about it is, is you never know what's going to trigger it or when it's gonna come. There's really no rhyme or reason to it, right? Um, these symptoms can just, of course there are triggers that can um, you know, enhance your experience. But a lot of this times this is just, you're living on, on a foundation of underlying fatigue and it's incredibly difficult. But um, so yeah, so once I was diagnosed, I, uh, you know, try to get through school. And then I went to college and earned my bachelor's degree in psychology and minored in healthcare ethics, and then went on to um, get my master's degree in social work where I did an emphasis on health. So um, I've dedicated my life to this. I, um, I've, MG has had such a profound impact on um, me and my family and um, my network. And I, I, I wanna make sure that those who live with this disease are armed with the tools and knowledge they need to advocate for themselves. And moreover, that the general public and community understands what it's like living with a disease like myasthenia gravis. You know, I think when people think of fatigue and weakness, they're like, oh, it's just, you know, get some rest. It's so much more than that. It impacts every single part of how you live, getting groceries, doing laundry, cleaning up the house, going to school, you know, you have to adapt and accommodate and, and, and work around those needs. And, 
and and it's a chore. It's 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 exhausting mentally and physically. So, um, I just I, I again I continue to uh, support this community any way that I can, and I I truly believe that patients and providers should all be shared. Uh, sharing a table and collecting that information together and engaging with one another. So um, I really appreciate this time. And again, that was a very fast forward um, uh, monologue, so to speak. But uh, thank you, Dr. Liao, for uh, allowing me to share my story. It's always an honor to do that. So, Well, uh, if anything, um, uh, on behalf of the medical community, we just want to thank you for taking something so personal and willing to share it and such a, a difficulty in your life to, to have the courage to really turn it into something so positive and pouring it into and using it to help other people. So um, can, can we just give Meredith a round of applause? Thank you, thank you, thank you. So how many of you are going to go into MG research, uh, become neuro becoming neurologist? But all of them, <laughs> all of them raise their hands. Uh, Okay, so um, uh, the bottom the bottom line is always listen to your patient. When your patient tell you that something, listen to them. Uh, listen, make sure you pay attention to their symptoms. Listen to the patients. Um, uh, thank you so much for what you do, Meredith, and what uh, MGFA uh, on behalf of the Hawaii community, uh, and and also with the help of the sponsors, we uh, and also. Uh, Dr. Ebermoich have uh, given up her honoraria. Uh, we would like to make a donation of $5,000 to MGFA. Oh, uh, wow. Thank you. That is so kind. Um, this, it is an honor and privilege to uh, support organizations such as yours. So uh, thank you. We'll... Thank you. And thank you all of you for listening and joining in. Um, it's truly a pr pr privilege and an honor. So thank you so much. Okay, next, uh, we'll go to the next slide. I'd like to introduce uh, our keynote speaker for the MG Symposium, Dr. Richard Nowak um, from Yale. Uh, Dr. Nowak, uh, hopefully you're on. There, there he is, Dr. Nowak. Uh, uh, personally, I'd like to thank you, first of all, for accepting our invitation to be the first uh, MG Symposium speaker. Uh, Dr. Nowak graduated from uh, with BS, uh, Bachelor of Science from Loyola, University of Chicago, uh, and then Master of Science from Northwestern, uh, and then he went to medical school at Drexel, uh, and then residency at Yale, and fellowship at Yale, uh, finished fellowship in 2012. Uh, he is focused on elucidating the immuno, immuno, immunopathologic mechanism of myasthenia gravis, uh, targeting the neuromuscular junction in patients, resulting in weakness. Uh, so uh, he knows more about myasthenia gravis than than all Dr. Virag and me and Carzana combined. So he he is truly the the expert on this. Uh, he's the assistant professor of neurology, the director of program in clinical and translation neuromuscular research, director of Yale myasthenia gravis uh, clinic at Yale um, uh, Medical School, and Dr. Nowak currently serves as the chief medical advisor to the myasthenia gravis foundation of America. Dr. Nowak, uh, welcome. Uh, thank you for giving us the thank, thank you so much for the invitation. Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. And can you see my slides? Yes. Excellent. So first off, I'm going to say aloha because every email that I've gotten from you, Dr. Liao, and, and your team always starts with aloha. So I uh, regretfully am not able to be there in person. And perhaps um, in future symposium, I, I will be able to, to make it out to, to join you all in person. So uh, I'm certainly honored and privileged to talk to you today, albeit um, uh, via Zoom. And I would like to have this as a conversation, an open dialogue. Um, the topic that I'm going to be presenting is advances in MG treatment and research for 2023 and beyond. But a little bit more than that, I wanted for this to be um, a discussion about the path to precision medicine and health. So Dr. Liao, you mentioned um, uh, just earlier this morning that uh, when you diagnosed a patient some years back, I think it was, uh, that there was a paucity of resources, a paucity of information as to how to go about potentially treating patients and even finding support for those patients with myasthenia gravis. 
But I, I really uh, do believe that with uh, recent advances that we're getting to um, develop uh, algorithms and paradigms uh, on a road to really taking care of our patients um, better than we did uh, in the past. And I think that's very promising. So these are my rel relevant disclosures. Uh, I just wanted to uh, emphasize that this presentation is intended to provide a high level update on targeted therapies and MGN is not necessarily intended to provide treatment recommendations. But I know that we have a little bit of uh, time at the end for a Q&A and I'm happy to address any, any questions regarding specific patients that you might have and things of that sort. Um, so in the past, we did not really need to actively consider uh, immunotherapy options from the perspective of, they were all sort of general immunosuppressive therapies. Steroids, azathioprine, mycophenolate, for instance, have um, many mechanisms of action, but in general, they're just broad immunosuppressive therapies. And as we uh, advance the field, we are developing targeted therapy. So a very careful and detailed understanding of key aspects of immunopathogenesis and MGN are important. That's something that I'm gonna to cover today. I'll review some of the data supporting targeted therapy approaches based on mechanism of action and also discuss emerging therapeutics and possible position in the treatment paradigm in um, uh, years to come. So I wanted to take a step back, and this is something that many of you, I think, already know, but just as a, as a quick refresh. So MG has a number of different subtypes and subgroups, and the disease is quite heterogeneous. So some people have, you know, talked about myasthenia gravis as a snowflake disease in that not everyone's myasthenia gravis is the same. Yes, what we read in the textbook in terms of clinical symptom presentation might be the textbook, but it might not necessarily be the same for every single individual. But some key immunopathogenic aspects of myasthenia that I think we need to really uh, understand is that there are antibody subtypes. So we have the acetylcholine receptor, which comprise the majority of patients, 70 to 80%. We have musk myasthenia gravis um, antibody subtype, which Depends who you read accounts for about four, maybe up to 9% of individuals. We have a smaller proportion of LRP4, and then seronegative um, accounts for maybe about 10 to 15%. Again, depends who you read. It's important to also realize that the way that we approach disease and treatment of a patient might differ from other sort of subgroupings or subtypes of MG. So we might not necessarily approach the treatment of someone with early onset generalized acetylcholine receptor antibody myasthenia gravis the same way as we would someone with late onset generalized myasthenia. So for instance, a thymectomy based on the MGTX study would be indicated for patients that are younger, 20s, 30s, 40s, uh, but someone that is in their 70s or 80s um, with onset of myasthenia gravis, we might not necessarily consider thymectomy because there's no evidence in support of that. Certainly thymoma associated disease, which is more or less a perineoplastic syndrome. And then we have the other sort of subgroups of individuals like ocular patients. I wanted to introduce sort of the main players in MG uh, immune network. So we have the thymus, we have T cells, B cells, and the plasma cells are simply mature B cells that are antibody producing cells. And it's important to actually understand the, the details about the main players of that immune network, because as treatments emerge, we are actually targeting specific components of that and not just broad immunosuppressive therapy. So what's the evidence and what are the therapeutic approaches that we have? Uh, we have inhibition of complement activation. So for, for instance, things like eculizumab or revulizumab. We have reduction of autoantibodies via inhibition of FCRN. Uh, so Fgartigmat, for instance, was uh, approved uh, recently for uh, antibody positive myasthenia gravis. And then we have cell depletion lymphocyte subsets. So things like anti-CD20 therapy, anti-CD19 therapy, for instance. So the, the rituximab or the inibilizumab. And then we have inhibition of cell function and mediators. So these are, um, and I'm not, not gonna go through each of these uh, in turn, but these are our currently available therapies for myasthenia gravis. Hopefully you can see my pointer. So we have the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, for instance, so protostigmine or mestinon. 
which simply uh, allow for a slower degradation of acetylcholine and there are more acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction to help overcome uh, weakness in patients. And then we have our typical rescue therapy approaches, IVIG and plasmapheresis. Sort of our first line immune therapy for the majority of patients is really corticosteroids or prednisone. And our very traditional sort of mainstay steroid sparing agents, which would be things like uh, imuran or azathioprine or mycophenolate, also known as CELSEPT. And then we have our biologics, rituximab, agilizumab, efcriptigamod, and rebulizumab, uh, for instance. Now, this um, is really important, and I'm going to show this slide again in a slightly different version, but therapeutic targets for currently available biologics for myasthenia graves. It's important to understand where we're using the medication in terms of targeting uh, the underlying amino uh, mechanism of disease. So like I mentioned before, we have the FCRN inhibitors, um, uh, Fgartigamod, we have rituximab, which targets and depletes B cells, but only those that are expressing the CD20 antigen at the, at the cell surface. And then we have our complement inhibitors like eculizumab and revulizumab. We have um, thymectomy in acetylcholine receptor antibody positive generalized patients. And then we have some other treatment strategies that are currently still under investigation for myasthenia gravis, like anti CD19 therapy. Inibilizumab is one of those, which was recently approved for uh, NMOSD uh, um, specifically. And then we have protease inhibitors. The complement system. So kind of moving on, well, what are we really targeting? I'm not gonna dwell on this figure too much, but we're really targeting C5 and we're preventing uh, MAC deposition and destruction um, at the uh, motor end plate or at the neuromuscular junction. So by uh, specifically inhibiting C5 or the complement system, we're preventing destruction um, at the tail end of that system. So what's the evidence in support of that? So REGAIN um, was a phase three uh, registrational trial that looked at patients with antibody positive uh, refractory generalized myasthenia gravis. And it demonstrated that there was um, significant clinical benefit on traditional clinical outcome measures like ADL, QMG, MG composite, and MGQOL. And this led to the approval of uh, eculizumab for the treatment of acetylcholine receptor antibody positive patients back in 2000. Uh, 17 at this point. Um, a pivotal phase three study uh, looking at another uh, C5 complement inhibitor, which is Zylucoplan. This study was recently published and demonstrated clinical benefit in, in patients, again, with acetylcholine receptor antibody, patient, antibody positive individuals, and this is currently with the FDA. The difference between Eculizumab and Zylucoplan, which you might start to hear about in uh, the, the months to come, depending on FDA decision, is this is a, a peptide and it's self-injectable. So it's a small volume injection, uh, which is given daily to, uh, to patients. Again, not FDA approved, but with the FDA for, for review and potential approval uh, for ACHR generalized patients. And then we have uh, the neonatal FC receptor inhibitors. And what's, what are we really doing? So we're essentially um, impacting the recycling of IgG. So by inhibiting the uh, FCRN receptor, we're actually allowing for um, a degradation of IgG. And certainly uh, autoantibodies in myasthenia gravis are of the IgG subtype. And uh, it allows for us to essentially reduce not only total IgG, but specifically, we're also reducing pathogenic autoantibodies. So conceptually, I would think about this sort of like plasmapheresis. It's not really plasmapheresis, but you're lowering pathogenic antibodies. Um, the data in support of, of f uh, uh in what led to its approval was the pivotal phase three trial that looked at generalized myasthenia gravis patients, and it demonstrated clinical benefit as compared to placebo. So this is something that we also have available to us um, uh, for our patients with uh, ACHR generalized myasthenia gravis. FCRN antagonists under investigation. So there is a number of them actually. None of these are yet um, uh, uh, through their development phases and uh, FDA approved, but you might start to hear about them 
in the next year or two, uh, such as uh, rosalixizumab, also sometimes affectionately known as, known as rosy, uh, nipiclimab, and batoclimab. Some of these are IV, and some of these are subcutaneous formulations, and some of them are, in fact, low-volume sub-Q uh, injections. So they're really advances, potential advances, as compared to um, F-carticamod in terms of ease of use and reduced burden for um, uh, patients with uh, myasthenia. So let me switch gears a little bit. So I talked about some of the, the newer targeted therapy strategies that um, have gained a lot of attention, and you've probably uh, heard about a lot of them um, recently. But immune cells are key to development of myasthenia gravis. So there is both in vitro and in vivo evidence that myasthenia gravis is a T-cell dependent, B-cell mediated disease. B-cell mediated via the production of uh, pathogenic autoantibodies with IgG. So many of our standard immunosuppressive therapies that we have, such as the azathioprine, the mycophenolate, broadly suppress function of and eliminate B cells and T cells. So many of these older medications really act on um, the spectrum of the uh, immunopathogenic mechanism of MG, and they're still pretty good uh, medications. Some of them, uh, there is a tolerance issue. Some of them are contraindicated for during pregnancy. Uh, or in anyone that might be uh, of childbearing potential, and certainly with um, uh, individuals that have active malignancy. But it's important to really kind of really understand that spectrum of the uh, immunopathic mechanism as uh, additional therapies um, become available, because many of them are really targeting key components of that uh, immune network. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, targeted B cell depletion therapy. So when we talk about B cells, it's not just one cell. B cells actually um, uh, develop in the bone marrow. In fact, they're called B cells because they're derived from the bone marrow and they have a maturation process. So uh, early on, uh, the, the cells are immature uh, and naive. And with stimulation, um, um, they actually uh, mature and develop into memory and then long-lived plasma blast and plasma cells. It's important to realize that antibody producing or antibody secreting B cells are really the plasma blast and plasma cells. So these here. So when we think about um, an anti-CD20 uh, directed therapy like rituximab, we're really only depleting uh, the middle and I say middle group kind of relatively, the middle group of B cells only. And we're not actually touching these uh, more long-lived uh, antibody secreting cells. So it's important to uh, understand this because we have available therapies like rituximab that we've used in many patients with MG, especially those that have been difficult to control have had refractory disease. And sometimes we ask the question, well, why does it work in one patient and it might not work in another patient? And it might be because we don't uh, understand the key driver to that individual's um, autoimmune myasthenia gravis. And it might be different from one patient to the next. Again, getting back to the heterogeneity of, of, um, of myasthenia. So um, what's the evidence in support of rituximab? So you know, anecdotally and, and case series and uncontrolled studies have really demonstrated uh, the benefits of rituximab, especially for refractory patients. Um, there was a, a, a placebo-controlled clinical trial that was done uh, several years ago now, which was a phase two trial looking at rituximab in acetylcholine receptor antibody positive generalized myasthenia gravis patient. And this study actually demonstrated safety, which is what a phase two trial is designed to do, um, but did not demonstrate um, a significant difference between a steroid sparing effect between the placebo and the, the group that got treated. In fact, um, approximately 56% of patients in placebo were successfully at tapering their, their steroid dose as compared to the treatment arm, which was 60%. Again, this is not necessarily uh, an indication that rituximab is not effective. This study actually was not designed to assess for efficacy, it was designed to assess for safety and to provide a go-no-go no go decision for whether or not to pursue 
rituximab uh, study in an efficacy or a phase three clinical trial. There were trends towards clinical benefit. None of those were uh, statistically significant. But what was observed is that patients um, in the placebo-treated group were at threefold likely to experience a disease exacerbation requiring rescue therapy with either IVIG or plasma paresis. So even though there was a lowering of steroid dose um, similar to the, the treatment arm, the patients seemed to do overall uh, less well. Rhinomax, which was a study that was published uh, just last year, uh, this was done in Europe, was a prospective placebo-controlled trial looking at antibody-positive patients. And this study actually um, did achieve its uh, primary outcome measure that demonstrated that uh, patients that received rituximab were more likely to achieve minimal manifestation status as compared to the placebo group. So if you look at panel A here, for instance, I'll just focus on this. At week 16, a little uh, less than 30% in the placebo group were able to achieve minimal manifestation status as compared to uh, the treatment arm, which was uh, a little over 70%. So this indicates that, at least from these data, that rituximab is in fact beneficial. This study, uh, the uh, patients that were enrolled were within two years of their initial uh, diagnosis. So there's differences in the study population, some key uh, attributes that uh, might have impacted the, the, the study results or the difference in the study results. What about for uh, must myasthenia? So rituximab, I think, uh, has become very commonly used in patients with must myasthenia gravis. There hasn't been a prospective placebo-controlled trial. However, a blinded prospective review experience that was published uh, back in 2017 demonstrated that patients that received rituximab were more likely to achieve uh, what's termed minimal manifestation status or better as compared to control. And I'll just highlight this number. So 77% achieved that status versus 26% in the control. So this provides us evidence, while it's not class one evidence, as it's not an RCT, it does provide class four evidence. And I think it's moved up pretty uh, high on the um, uh, treatment paradigm for folks diagnosed with musk myasthenia. So remember I talked about um, CD20 and CD19. So CD20-directed therapy is not uh, in any way um, depleting antibody-secreting cells. So what if in certain patients, the, the lack of therapeutic benefit with rituximab is really driven by the fact that um, the plasmablastin plasma cells are already established, and these are long-lived cells, and that you can use all the rituximab you want or any CD20 therapy, and you're not really going to make an impact, a clinical impact on, on disease. So that's where CD19-directed therapies kind of emerge in the, in the potential treatment paradigm. And studies in myasthenia gravis really led um, to inabilizumab or anti-CD19 therapy from the BDMG trial, which, as I said, didn't really see a significant difference uh, in, the, in, in the groups treated. So this is the inabilizumab trial that is enrolling. It's actually currently still enrolling, looking at ACHR and MUSC patients. Um, what about other targeted cell depletion therapy? So anti-CD30 uh, therapy, which actually only really looks and depletes the plasma cells and plasma blasts. It does have some impact certainly on uh, NK cells and other uh, T cells as well. So this is something that might be potentially applicable to, um, uh, to myasthenia treatment. Uh, early uh, phase trials have been more or less equivocal. None of them have really been published um, out there, but you can find some of them on clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, other B-cell targeted approaches, so we have uh, bortezomab, bulimimab. Um, uh, we also have uh, CFZ533, which actually targets um, uh, CD40. And then we have CAR-T. So this is really uh, engineering uh, T cells directed at antigen-specific B cells. And those clinical trials are currently in their early phase. And so we're really taking um, an individual's uh, cells and actually engineering T cells to really directly kill those B cells that are autoantibody producing. 
And so there's promise as that uh, field develops. And this is really uh, borrowed from our colleagues in, in, um, uh, in oncology. So I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. Uh, the, the four W questions, who, what, when, and why? So which, which treatment do we use for which patient? When do we use it? And why do we use it? I think these are really fundamental uh, questions that I went, wanted for you guys to kind of think about, um, not only this morning, but um, as you care for patients with myasthenia gravis in the future. So in order to kind of talk through that a little bit, I'm, I'm getting back to this slide that I had presented before. So for acetylcholine receptor antibody positive myasthenia, what is the immunomechanism, so to speak? So you know, we have uh, a developing uh, B cell, uh, naive B cell repertoire that's coming out of the bone marrow. And that gets into the periphery or into the circulation. And these are naive B cells that need antigen stimulation um, and T cell health as they mature. With that antigen stimulation, you can have incorrect antigen stimulation with acetylcholine receptor, for instance. Many of those B cells actually then go into the, th oops, sorry about that, go into the thymus. And that's where they sort of hang out. They can go into the thymus, they can go into the lymph nodes. So we believe that um, there's a reservoir of B cells residing in the thymus that when you remove those with thymectomy, you can actually improve the clinical status of patients with myasthenia gravis. So that's why we believe, because this is a hypothesis, why thymectomy is especially beneficial in early onset acetylcholine receptor antibody positive myasthenia gravis. One thing that I think the group uh, already knows is, um, is the following. So the thymus is fairly large um, as, as you're uh, young um, and your immune system is maturing. But after the age of 18 or 20, it starts to involute, it starts to shrink, it starts to turn to fat. About two to 3% of the thymus actually shrinks annually. And so by the time you get into your late 40s, certainly past 50, definitely by 60, you really don't have significant thymus tissue. It's basically adipose tissue at that time. And there's likely not a reservoir uh, of B cells residing in the thymus because there's nowhere for them to be. It's really just fat. Um, anyhow, so um, we have that reservoir there, but B cells do mature and they mature into memory B cells and then it's a short-lived plasma blast, and then long-lived plasma cells. So it's really here, like these two arms of the uh, anti-CD20. So if it's really the memory B cell pool that's driving um, the autoantibody production through more short-lived plasma cells that are still retaining CD20 expression, an anti-CD20 therapy may actually be quite beneficial. However, if really the majority of the pathogenic autoantibodies are being um, produced by long-lived plasma cells that have lost their CD20 expression, you really are not going to impact them if there's not a, a driver to the disease that um, is earlier on. You're going to need to utilize something like an anti-CD19 therapy, potentially. That is still yet to be proven in terms of its effectiveness in, in uh, this antibody subtype of disease. And then certainly we have the downstream, the available therapies um, that have been approved in recent years, which is FCRN inhibition, which really essentially lowers I uh, levels and lowers acetylcholine receptor autoantibodies. And then the complement inhibitors that prevent uh, the destruction of the acetylcholine receptor, as noted earlier. But what about musk MG? You know, I believe we believe that they're uh, different in, in some ways. Um, so kind of the same thing, we have the immature B cells or, or naive B cells, and then they have antigen stimulation, T cell help. We, we think that those um, B cells then just simply go to the lymph nodes. There have been some um, studies that have looked at thymectomy uh, in patients with uh, musk myasthenia gravis, and um, most of the data out there that's published in the literature don't really support that it's helpful. Uh, there is one or two reports that has conflicting data, but um, there has not been a prospective study like uh, was done with MGTX. So with uh, anti-CD20 therapy, many patients actually have a dramatic clinical benefit pretty quickly 
So we do believe that uh, the memory B cell pool is likely, and the short plasma blasts are likely driving uh, pathogenic autoantibody production because of such uh, a robust um, a clinical response that's, a, that's observed in the majority of patients. So we do think that they're distinct uh, immunologically. The other, the other uh, component here that is really important to understand is that mosque antibodies are IgG4 subtype. And so there is not a complement uh, um, component to, uh, to the destruction or damage or effect on the acetylcholine receptors. So they're distinct in that way. So there's no evidence in support of complement inhibitors being beneficial uh, in patients with musk mg However, FCRN inhibitors, on the other hand, although uh, the studies, um, the FDA has not approved it for, for musk as yet, um, would lower IgG4. It lower all of the subgroups, really. So it would have a, a potential clinical benefit in, in those individuals. We kind of move to... Um, uh, another idea here uh, beyond just targeted therapies. And, and that's um, why do people get uh, autoimmune disease? So this is you know your usual event and you have autoimmune disease here. This is coming from a nature immunology paper that was published over 20 years ago at this point in time, but this is uh, really important. And this can apply to any autoimmune disease. What we've been talking about for the last uh, 20, 25 minutes is immune regulation or immune dysregulation leading to autoimmunity or autoimmune disease. But there are certainly genetic factors or genetic polymorphisms that likely predispose individuals to developing autoimmune disease. It's not just a question or an imbalance in immune regulation. And certainly environmental factors yet to be determined as to uh, uh, what might trigger an individual that might have the right genes and might have some immune regulation issues to uh, tip them into autoimmune disease. So social determinants of health essentially is what I'm talking about in some level here, uh, really important uh, in uh, current knowledge gaps for MG and many uh, autoimmune diseases, frankly. So what's the problem? The problem um, is this, the normal immune system protects against foreign invaders and it actually does surveillance against cancer cells but in autoimmune disease, it occurs when the immune system loses tolerance to cell tissue. So what about tolerance? Can we, can we get our immune system to be tolerant of our cells? Because that's the problem. We're not tolerant. The immune system is not tolerant. It's attacking our cells. So that's where antigen-specific therapy might actually hold a lot of great promise, where we're actually um, taking uh, and modulating and actually uh, uh, inactivating CD4 and CD8 T cells that are helping with the maturation of B cells over time. So this actually has potential great promise as a, a treatment strategy to induce tolerance. So essentially reprogramming the immune system to stop uh, the production of autoantibodies at, at the end of the day, so to speak. And this is currently uh, in early phase uh, clinical development for myasthenia gravis, and there are similar programs in other uh, autoimmune diseases with antigen-specific therapy. So what are the knowledge gaps that we currently have? We don't have predictive markers, meaning that patients that might present with very mild symptoms or ocular symptoms, we don't really know how to determine whether or not they're gonna progress to generalized disease. We don't have predictive markers in terms of um, uh, uh, what they're going to respond to in terms of the, the medication strategy. So a lot of it is trial and error. We do have an established treatment paradigm that we apply, but not all patients you know, really follow that. Personalized health, we don't have uh, specifics regarding that. And then the impact across the spectrum of socioeconomic status or social determinants of health and understanding racial and ethnic disparities in, in patients with, with myasthenia gravis. So these are areas that further investigation is, is critically important. So, you know, as sort of the, the title or the theme of uh, today's session, addressing unmet need and improving MG care, these are the areas that we still really uh, don't have uh, answers to in a very optimistic 
uh, and hopeful that um, in time we, we will get there. So what are we missing? Um, this genes, genetics, the race, ethnicity, you know, what impact of any uh, might there be on, on disease and how do we factor this in? Um, and that environmental piece, so getting back to that Venn diagram. So these are areas um, that we don't have good information on. We understand the immune regulation or dysregulation part pretty well, um, uh, you know, based on what I uh, discussed earlier today, but those other factors I think are um, equally important to understand as we try to develop um, more personalized uh, strategies to care. So moving the needle forward, um, where are we going in the next five to 10 years? What is on the horizon and beyond and the quest for the Holy Grail? Is that possible for autoimmune disease? And you know, my general sense is that I remain very optimistic that the last five to 10 years has led to new targeted therapy strategies and over the next upcoming five to 10 years, we'll even get a lot closer to that potential holy grail or development of, of even tolerance inducing medication strategies or treatment strategies. Um, it's important for us to realize that treatment plans and treatment strategies need to be evidence-based. So there's currently um, a lack of comparative efficacy trials uh, where we look at one treatment versus another treatment and a third treatment and a forward treatment and see how individual patients do over time. It's a lot of, okay, we have this available option. We have the clinical trials that support their use, but some patients will not respond. None of the trials that I presented, although I didn't present all of them, was there a 100% uh, response in 100% of patients. It needs to be mechanism driven. So what I would like to instill in, in, in everyone, um, which seems obvious, but that we understand what we're doing with the medication, understand the mechanism of action uh, carefully and apply that um, to our patients, depending on their antibody subtype or other uh, uh, subtyping of their disease, and then that precision medicine strategy. We still don't know why people get an MG in the current research. Uh, deeper understanding is emerging. We understand the the main players here. Uh, and then partnerships with patients, physicians, scientists, industry, and I think um, most certainly the government are, are critical to our future success over time. Um, this is a treatment paradigm or treatment paradigm considerations that I uh, wanted to kind of talk through a little bit. Um, this was published a couple of years ago now, actually a few years ago now by um, Professor Montegaza in Italy. This is a very standard approach, um, but it actually also introduces how we might go about um, incorporating some of the newer targeted strategies in, in our treatment plan. So we'll start at the top. So not uncommonly, many patients, especially with mild disease, will start on a medication like protostatin, and not uncommonly will a low dose of prednisone be added uh, to help improve their symptoms. And then we have our conventional kind of approach, steroids, and then plus or minus an immunosuppressive therapy. And here what I'm talking about more so is the mycophenolate and, and azathioprine. But if those don't work, then we move on to our more targeted therapy strategies that are currently available like complement inhibitor, FCRN inhibitors, and then uh, B cell depletion therapies, for instance. But what about an alternative approach to immuno? therapy in patients with myasthenia gravis. Why do we have to start with this sort of conventional approach? Many a time, the standard immunosuppressive therapies take months to work. So, and not uncommonly in individuals that have um, moderate or significant symptoms that are disabling, they require uh, a lot of steroids to, to get them stable and keep them out of the hospital. So do we really have to kind of do it in this more standard approach, or can we, you know, utilize some of the newer agents earlier on? So if you look at the data, um, which I didn't get into too much, the time to benefit with a complement inhibitor, the time to benefit with an FCRN inhibitor are typically within weeks, within several weeks. Um, and that's important to understand is that unlike 
the older therapies like an azathioprine or a mycophenolate that takes several months before we can uh, observe clinical benefit. Uh, these agents work relatively uh, quickly when they work in patients. And so it is possible that introducing these earlier on uh, might actually be uh, better, improve outcomes, and uh, minimize the, the burdens of therapy from a side effect profile. Um, and so those are kind of my general thoughts in terms of the overall uh, treatment paradigm and where we are currently, the evidence for it, the mechanism, and where the unmet needs are. Um, I'm going to, uh, oh, I do have more slides actually, sorry. So um, these are my summary and final words. So new and emerging strategies in the care and treatment of individuals with myasthenia remain promising. It's an exciting time. And it's critical that physicians and patients are partners in that uh, successful endeavor. So we can't really do anything without our patients. And I would instill in you the patients that um, you all see in clinic is to invite them to participate in research. There are a number of um, uh, patient self-reported registries. There are a number of clinical studies and certainly interventional clinical trials that their participation in those really can um, shape the future and the progress that we make in uh, care for patients um, with this condition. Um, as I noted before, establishing evidence-based treatment paradigms for patients and then elucidating more precisely the mechanisms of immune dysregulation and tailoring treatments to individual patients is really where our needs are and where we're going in an effort towards precision medicine and health. So I'll, I'll stop there and I've left ample time for, for questions that you might have. And again, please, um, you know, as, as directly as possible, I would like for this to be uh, open and conversational as a dialogue. So thank you again for this invitation and um, for my ability to participate in your symposium uh, today. Thank you, Dr. Nowak. Uh, any questions for Dr. Nowak? What led you to like specialize in MG like this? How did you get on that path? That's, that's an excellent question. So um, perhaps like many neurology residents, um, when I was a resident, uh, we spend a lot of time on the inpatient service or in the ICU seeing stroke patients. And so I, I actually initially, um, perhaps like many, was interested in vascular neurology, but saw many patients with MG exacerbations or crisis in the hospital. And I looked at uh, myasthenia gravis and the status of myasthenia gravis 15, over 15 years ago now, and there was nothing being done, absolutely nothing, that was you know, moving the, the, the field forward. There were no clinical trials. Um, and the ones that were done, many of them um, uh, were not positive, sort of the mycophenolate uh, trial that was done in the sort of mid-2000s. And I thought I can make a difference and contribute to the field when no one was really doing it. Um, so I was really uh, inspired by my being able to make a difference. And I felt that the field of myasthenia gravis for a condition that has a known antibody was not paid any attention to in a way that was really getting us to where we needed to be with um, improved care for our patients. So I kind of latched on, and, and I've been working in the area of myasthenia um, uh, for the last uh, near 15 years at this point. Maybe I could ask the leading questions. Uh, there's a number of me medical students and uh, interns here. Are there uh, opportunities at your lab, at, at Yale, uh, internship that they could uh, possibly look into? Yeah, absolutely. It depends on um, if it's uh, clinical research or translational and or um, wet, uh, a, a wet lab. So we have potential opportunities to, to do research with us. Um, and um, perhaps, you know, Dr. Liao, at the end, you can, you know, uh, connect us or share my contact information for anyone interested to just reach out to me directly. 
Thank you. Other questions for? Yes, Dr. Uh, Dr. Tarzana. Dr. Novak, thank you for the lecture. Excellent. Uh, question I have is whether in the with the care in our memory, care in our drugs we have in an acute uh, early first presentation, uh, is there ways to managing a patient that is uh, corticosteroid sparing so that we basically don't put the patient through the path of corticosteroids and that potential side effects of it? Can we do that with the care of the carry that we have? And if such, how will you manage the patient? Did you hear the question? Yeah, and I'll just repeat the question to make sure that I that I have all of the details. So this is a uh, a newly diagnosed patient that has a, a myasthenia gravis exacerbation or crisis. And correct. the question is, is that correct? Yes, correct. Um, and how to manage that patient without the use of um, any corticosteroids? Yes, correct. Yeah. So um, I, I think in general, we, we do use corticosteroids in those individuals, but um, a standard approach for rescue therapy would either be plasma phoresis or IVIG. Now, um, that might be adequate and enough, and you might not be able to, you might not need to use corticosteroids. It really depends on, on the patient. Um, but you're right, some patients they might have a significant intolerance or the side effect uh, or even potential contraindication to steroids where you might not want to use 60 milligrams of prednisone daily or a high dose of IV solumedrol. So in, in those patients, I typically would still start a low dose of prednisone, of maybe 10 milligrams. But following, say, IVIG, um, there is no reason uh, to not uh, consider one of the newer targeted therapy strategies like um, rebulizumab um, or even uh, fcartigamod. There's nowhere does it say that you have to put them on steroids, and if they fail steroids, um, to start the other medication. Um, so, I mean, the, every patient is unique, and the circumstances um, are unique for that individual. Uh, but there's no... Um, contraindication to kind of going and avoiding steroids, especially if you think that the risk of steroids is too great for that individual patient. Thank you. Correct. Right. Well, thank you, Dr. Rector. I'm uh, Jason Burek. I'm one of the neurologists here. Um, I had a couple of questions if I could. One is, you didn't mention IVIG very much. Do you consider it a, a targeted therapy? Or uh, a more general therapy. Yeah, so so IVIG or sub QIG, uh, they're immunoglobulin therapies, and the way that I um, talk about them, although th this hasn't caught on, I I used to call it a dirty biologic, and I put dirty in in parentheses because it has multiple mechanisms of action, including it has some effect on uh, the FCRN receptor and causes. Uh, inhibition of the FCRN receptor. It also, believe it or not, although no one talks about it, uh, it, it affects um, um, and inhibits the, the, the complement system. So I didn't talk about it as much because the evidence for it um, is not um, uh, robust as a maintenance therapy. So we do definitely use it as rescue, um, but as a maintenance therapy, the studies that have been published where they were prospective and placebo controlled have not really been um, that strong. It is true though, uh, prior to recent um, medication, the newer targeted therapy strategy approvals, that there was a time when we would uh, put uh, very difficult to control patients on chronic IVIG or even chronic plasma phoresis. And I still have patients that I do manage with chronic immunoglobulin therapy, less so with chronic plasma phoresis, um, uh, but I do have patients out there that that is the, the treatment strategy that works best for them. But the evidence, again, the evidence, so I talked about evidence-based, um, that is less strong um, in the medical literature. If I could, I wanted to ask about Cartigamod, it's a new treatment. Yes. Um, 
And it's the, um, the guidance from the FDA is kind of vague about how often and how long to keep on going with the treatment. I, I've read some things. It, it's uh, um, uh, people maintain on, you know, seven cycles. And then I recently read a few patients on 11 cycles, uh, 10 or 11 cycles. Uh, what's your feeling and, or what's the thinking now with this new treatment? Um, well, you know, for maintaining people on it if Excellent question. So the clinical trial does not uh, inform us in any way, and I think uh, currently there is a need for real-world evidence uh, with Fgartigamod in, in practice. So um, just for the group, um, it's one cycle is defined as uh, a weekly infusion times four. That's one cycle. And then that's to be repeated at some interval uh, later, uh, depending on how a patient is doing. So if they get better and then they start to worsen again, then you're to repeat it. So anecdotally, from my experience, I found that treating them with four infusions, that one cycle, while it does get some patients better, it's um, an incomplete response anecdotally. So we've typically started patients on a series of cycles uh, to, to, to get them better and to keep them better and then try to uh, extend the interval between cycles. For, for instance, I'm just going to uh, ballpark this a little bit. So we'll give a cycle for weekly infusions and then give them a, a month, month and a half without and then start it again and have it as a standard cycle for at least three, 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 three treatment cycles and then sort of evaluate over that uh, period of time, number one, did it help them? Did they get better? And number two, are they having fluctuations in their symptoms from one cycle to the next? And if not, then we try to extend um, the period of time that they're off of therapy to see how far we could stretch it out. Um, while the trial was designed to kind of demonstrate that you could stretch it out, um, it it leaves that unanswered question, well, what do we do now in practice now that we have it available for prescription? How do we manage our patients with it? And it, and it becomes a lot of trial and error. Some of the other um, FCRN inhibitors that are uh, under investigation or recently completed some of their clinical trials uh, are addressing that. Um, and I think, you know, more to come. So I would just, you know, keep an ear kind of open to what's coming out there in the literature. We don't have data just yet. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Any other questions? Well, I'll ask the last question, Dr. Nowak. Um, on one of your slides, you know that the knowledge gap is in racial uh, disparity. Do you have uh, good, inf good information on NG on uh, Native Hawaiians and Asians population? Um, we, we don't. We don't, we don't have that information. At least it's not something that I'm aware of. Um, so that's currently something that, you know, it would be a tremendous help. So if there is a way, and I would encourage this, um, to kind of report the, the, um, the prevalence and incidence, for instance, in Hawaii that would be tremendous and actually have a breakdown uh, uh, based on race and ethnicity um, would be wonderful contribution to, to the medical field because there might be some key differences that um, we just don't know about. Let me ask you a question, if I could. May I? Yes. <laughs> okay. So um, let me just ask, so the patients that you all take care of in Hawaii that have myasthenia gravis. Um, do you see more antibody positive patients like ACHR, must patients, and older patients? Like in general, what is the experience uh, with myasthenia gravis in Hawaii? So, uh, you probably kind of, I'm, uh, this is uh, Jason Beer again. I was just asking you and. Um, uh, you kind of cut me up short. I don't have specific statistics, but we have a fair amount of ocular myasthenia, um, which uh, most of whom here are seronegative. Um, a few seropositive, but 
and it, it, it actually when zero positive ocular myasthenia it, 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 it's going to be general myasthenia um and then the, the majority of our general myasthenia patients are people coma receptor positive i mean I, it's, it's got to be more than 80 percent that's just our experience here yeah. um uh i can only offhand think of one patient who was a bus positive um, would would it be uh, and 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 the reason I ask that thank you Dr. Viragi is also um, a lot of students are working on projects looking at uh, um, uh, racial disparities and uh, Native Hawaiians and Asian population and um, in, in certain conditions there are just like MS there's some just because like autoimmune disease there are different racial we have more NMO and uh, spinal manifestation with MS. Uh, we were just wondering about, you know, whether you have uh, there's any data. Uh, uh, so, yeah. yeah, that that would be a wonderful um, uh, project, actually, to you know look at some social determinants of health outcomes. You know how patients do in in various groups. Um, those it's voluntary for the project. <laughs> So there would no, be a no, everybody volunteered. Everyone, no, I didn't see any hands. I can see, I can see a little bit, but I didn't see any hands. <laughs> oh, one hand. That's can um, I can I just add something to that? Um, yes. you know, I think that's what what the beauty of a registry is, right? You know, um, with the registry, we really hope to uh, inform the data if we see, you know, patterns in, in racial and ethnic disparities or or certain cultures or certain. Um, whether it's female and male, you know, that, that's really the beauty of the registry is to get people to join from all different backgrounds and perhaps maybe eventually see a pattern uh, within MG. Um, I also think it's important to encourage uh, participation in clinical trials um, and to diversify those clinical trials, right? Because clinical trials are notoriously <clears throat> and historically biased. So encouraging participation in those and making sure that uh, patients are represented uh, within the research data. Thank you for that. And uh, Dr. Barak, which MG clinical trials were you involved in recently? Do you remember? Oh, uh, um, anyway, uh, yeah. anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway, we're involved in a number of uh, trials and, and we did have two uh, at least two MG trials. Uh, we, I think it would be great uh, for the opportunities for uh, Hawaii and our community to contribute if there's uh, future opportunities for uh, clinical trials uh, to consider uh, polling some uh, population from uh, Hawaii and you know uh, the Pacific region. Uh, thank you. You want to say something, Dr. Noah? Oh no, sorry. I I, uh, I guess I put myself on mute. No, I no, I th I thank you, um, and I think it would be a wonderful project for 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 you all or one of the students or residents. So um, you know, please reach out if if any if any questions. And I thank you again for uh, inviting me to participate today. No, we we thank you, and I let and I will uh, so that you don't get uh, one hundred emails from the students and. The interns, I will reach out to you and uh, get some relevant information about potential internship and uh, research at Yale, and then I'll pass it on to the students. Uh, please don't email Dr. Nowak multiple times a day. Uh, I, I will try to, uh, but thank you for making the opportunity and thank you for taking time to uh, speak to uh, the medical community and students here in Hawaii and investing in us. Um, uh, before you go, uh, I have two favors to ask you. Favor number one is uh, we're going to take, I'm going to take a picture with you with Shay and Kira. Uh, so, uh, Shay and Kira, just stand by Dr. Noah here. Uh, we're going to take a picture with you. Just because they're here, they are, they are, okay, just stand here. We're just going to pretend like uh, we're working on some. Uh, the shaka here. Good. Okay. Our second request, Dr. Nowak, is for you. Um, you have a neurology fellow at Yale by the name of uh, Darren Dugas. 
in the epilepsy program. He was just here two weeks ago uh, interviewing for positions. So is there any way you could tell him that Hawaii needs neurologists, that he needs to come here? Uh, I, I'm just I'm just kidding. Uh, we are very, very um, uh, uh, short of neurologists here in Hawaii. And uh, we, we really like your fellow that we interview. And um, uh, um, if there's any way you could just tell him how great Hawaii is, <laughs> and, uh, uh, we, would, uh, we would appreciate it. And, and once again, thank you for taking time and to both you and Meredith for taking time to uh, talk to uh, our Hawaii and be part of our first uh, MG symposium. Let's give Dr. Noah a round. Okay. All right. Okay, how are you guys doing? You guys okay so far? Good, good. Uh, what is the complement system? Just the uh, Julia and Ward told you guys about the quiz, right? About Dr. Nowak's lecture. What is the complement system responsible for? And no, I'm just kidding. That's no quiz. Uh, if you need the restroom, it's straight out. Okay. Uh, and then don't worry, refreshments and lunch or breakfast is coming. Uh, uh, thank you to uh, our sponsors for feeding the students. So, um, so bear with us. We have one more lecture by our own uh, Dr. Jeanette Abramowitz. Uh, we can share. Hi everyone. Uh, I was when um, Dr. Liao asked me to speak um, today. I was I was really kind of I was excited because um, I have a very memorable case from residency um, that relates to this topic. Uh, we're going to talk about psychiatric considerations um, and myasthenia gravis. And I'm so glad that Meredith was able to um, share her story too about how long it took her to get diagnosed and how things can be um, misinterpreted. So um, I was on night float uh, during my fifth year because um, the combination um, residency for neuro neurology and psychiatry is six years. Um, so I was on neurology night float, um, which if there are neurologists um, in the room or just FYI for people who um, are going to go into neurology, um, you can have like life or death situations uh, pretty frequently and it can be very um, nerve wracking. Um, you know, there's strokes, there's all sorts of hemorrhagic strokes, bleeds, um, spinal cord injuries. Um, so it was one of my night float nights and the sun was coming up, which was always like a very welcome, welcome thing. Um, and I got called to the ED because there was um, a woman who um, had uh, was supposed to, was had a diagnosis or some some sort of diagnosis, potential diagnosis of my senior gravis, and they were wondering if um, she needed to be intubated. Um, so I go down to see her, and she's um, really, really, really distressed, uh, working very, very hard to breathe. Um, I don't remember the details of like her single breath count or her peak expiratory flow or anything like that, but very, working very, very hard to breathe. Um, and I was like, eat this. So I made the decision that, um, you know, she needed to be intubated because, you know, it was um, patients in my clinic crisis can go um, downhill 
um, very quickly and it can be very dangerous. So um, she was intubated and then my, um, my attending came in um, like an hour later who um, was, is a really brilliant um, neuroimmunologist and I respect her very much. And she said, actually, we think this isn't really my thing in gravis. We think this is anxiety. Um, and I was shocked um, that could, because she seemed so, she seemed so distressed and her work of breathing was so hard. And I had done psychiatry by that point. So I'd seen like anxiety attacks and, and, and whatnot. And it, it didn't come off as like an anxiety attack or a panic attack to me. And um, my attending went on to explain to me um, that, you know, she was, um, Anybody negative for both uh, acetylcholine receptor and musk. And I was thinking to myself, wow, I don't know what happened, ended up happening to that patient in the long term, but she went up to the ICU because she was intubated. Um, and then she that she had a repeat um, failure to extubate um, multiple times. And psych was consulted because they were wondering if there was a psychiatric reason why um, they weren't able to extubate her. And and I was thinking to myself, you know, I've never seen a site condition that was playing so much of a role that someone couldn't be extubated. So who knows? Maybe she was one of the seronegative um, patients. I, I don't know what ended up happening with her. I didn't even know about seronegative um, at that point. So that was very interesting. Um, okay. So we're going to talk about um, the interplay between um, psychiatric diagnoses and psychiatric symptoms um, and myasthenia gravis. Um, and before we start, I just want to make a comment on um, psychiatric conditions uh, and neurological um, diagnoses in general. Um, as, as you're probably um, not surprised, they're very, very uh, common. And depression is actually the most common um, comorbidity in any um, neurological condition. Um, so very, very prevalent depression, 20 and 20 to 50% of neuro patients. So stroke, MS, epilepsy, Parkinson's, dementia, myasthenia gravis have a diagnosis of uh, depression. Um, and this is important for many, many reasons. Um, one of the reasons is depression is an independent predictor of poor quality of life in patients with these neurological disorders. And um, it's been found to have a negative impact on um, treatment whether or not they respond to treatment, disease course, whether or not they accept treatment, um, and even recovery of neuro, various neuro deficits. Um, so, and you might have heard of the FLAME trial for the students, um, where they, it is controversial at this point, but um, for example, um, there was a study shown that maybe there was some benefit in motor recovery in stroke patients um, if they were started on Prozac after their stroke. So it's interesting. Um, and then it's also bi-directional. Depression um, may be a risk factor for stroke, epilepsy, and Parkinson's disease um, as well. And I think there's good data at this point to show that depression is a risk factor for uh, myocardial infarction. So it's not surprising that it could be a risk factor um, for these conditions as well. Whether or not it's through eating habits or other confounding factors, we don't know. But um, it's interesting, interesting idea. So to talk about myasthenia gravis, um, psychiatric conditions and myasthenia gravis are very, very common. Um, the depression prevalence um, varies between 14% and 58%, and the anxiety prevalence varies between 20 and 55%. Um, the anxiety prevalence may be even higher than anxiety prevalence and stroke, and we'll talk about um, why that might be the case um, in particular for myasthenia patients, myasthenia gravis patients. Um, and stroke, the uh, anxiety prevalence is thought to be around 24 to 29%, and MS anxiety is thought to be 22%. So there is some evidence that anxiety um, prevalence is even higher in myasthenia and gravis patients. Um, panic disorder um, is found to be um, have a 7% prevalence, and then PTSD um, after a respiratory after an episode of respiratory insufficiency um, was found um, in 51%. Um, which is not surprising given um, how stressful and scary that could be. Okay, so 
This is important for a number of reasons um, for neurologists to be aware of and psychiatrists because they might get consulted on, on my pain medications. Um, psychiatric symptoms can mimic myasthenia gravis symptoms and vice versa, which can confound um, and delay um, the appropriate diagnosis. Uh, so weakness in myasthenia gravis um, can be rapidly fluctuating. And I think Meredith um, spoke about this, which can um, give the impression that it's not a real symptom um, or that it's functional um, in nature. Um, and there's a lot of case reports and evidence and um, case uh, 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 interviews with patients that show that emotional distress um, can be associated with um, onset of illness course of illness and that this is more prevalent um, in, in women. Um, on the, the flip side of that coin, it's fatigue, um, which is obviously very common in myasthenia gravis and shortness of breath. Uh, because, um, it also can be seen um, in just plain depression. Um, facial weakness and blepharotosis can be mistaken for apathy and depression um, as well. Uh, and, um, and one study um, looking at myasthenia gravis patients evaluated by general practitioners, 27% were first diagnosed with quote-unquote neurotic disorder. Um, and when MG diagnosis is missed, young women are more likely to get a psych diagnosis as a cause of their symptoms, and men are more likely to be diagnosed with another somatic illness. And uh, women average latency to diagnosis um, is three years, and men latency to diagnosis is 1.3 years. So the overlap between psychiatric symptoms um, and myasthenia gravis symptoms um, present a um, challenge for um, psychiatrists and neurologists and patients. Uh, another reason why this is important is uh, most myasthenia gravis patients believe that stressful life event events can contribute to onset exacerbation and progression. Um, there are case reports of psychological disturbances, such as uh, mood disturbances preceding onset of myasthenia gravis. Uh, one in three patients and 150 patient uh, group reported emotional stress predated their first symptom. And many patients believe that their behavior, their attitude, and their degree of self-care um, which, you know, includes exercise, stress reduction, avoidance of emotional, emotional triggers, um, helps control their symptoms. Uh, and then two-thirds of patients in this same 150 patient group um, reported that stress um, exacerbates their disease. Another reason why uh, psychiatric conditions um, are, and psychiatric symptoms are important in my, myasthenia gravis have to do with um, a concept called health-related um, quality of life. Um, so that's what the HRQOL stands for. Uh, so this is, um, there's a scale where um, this can be measured and it's been validated across uh, multiple chronic conditions. Um, and then there's one also specific um, for myasthenia gravis, um, which is nice. Um, but it was found that, um, not surprisingly, health-related health quality of life was um, decreased. So decreased, a, a lesser score is associated with worse quality of life, and it varies from like zero to one. Um, so it was decreased with severity um, of uh, the myasthenia gravis um, based on a QMG score, which I'm not that familiar with the QMG score, but I think it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's another scale that's related to um, the severity of the symptoms and especially concerning muscle weakness and physical disability. Um, healthcare of health related quality of life was also found to be decreased um, in female gender, um, people who are older, people with increased BMI, and people with poor acceptance of the diagnosis. Um, but then there were, interestingly, it was found to be improved with disease duration. Um, health-related quality of life, not surprisingly, um, was um, found to be lower um, when the patient had perceived um, fewer social supports um, and were living alone. And um, 
the healthcare health related quality of life has um, psychiatric has a psychiatric dimension to it or an emotional dimension and a physical dimension. And so it was found that better better physical quality of life was found in patients with higher educational level and intellectual work, um, probably because their symptoms didn't interfere as much um, with their work. There's unclear data if thymectomy affects quality of life um, and may be dependent on gender. That's um, up for debate. And um, increased physical disability likely leads to reduced daily activities and social interactions, um, which leads to decreased quality of life. Um, and then also um, one final point on this, patients with ocular symptoms um, have been found to have fewer um, reductions or almost no reductions in quality of life. So it's probably, we'll talk about this more in a little bit, it's probably the respiratory symptoms and the bulbar symptoms that really interfere with people's um, social interactions um, and quality of life. So health-related quality of life and psychiatric symptoms are bi-directional, and that's why um, health-related quality of life is important for this talk. Um, depression is a statistically significant prognostic factor for worse quality of life in myasthenia gravis patients. Um, depression correlates with increased somatic complaints, um, ambulatory visits, and healthcare costs, which probably contribute to the lower quality of life. Um, anxiety as well is also a statistically significant predictor of poor quality of life in myasthenia patients. Um, and odds of anxiety increased by 10% and odds of depression increased by 20% for each one point increase in the myasthenia gravis health-related quality of life um, score. All right, so we're gonna talk mostly about depression um, and anxiety um, and how that presents in myasthenia gravis and how you can manage it. Um, but before we talk about um, depression, more specifically, I just wanted to have one slide on um, the issue and the symptom of fatigue in myasthenia gravis um, and also in other autoimmune disorders because fatigue overlaps with depression and can be um, confused with depression. So what is fatigue? Uh, fatigue is diminished capacity to engage in self-motivated -motiva behavior. Um, it's also um, known to be a subjective feeling and it leads to poor self-efficacy and therefore difficulties in participating in health promoting behaviors. And this is likely mediated by um, pro-inflammatory cytokines. Um, so it's, it's seen in uh, many um, neuroinflammatory um, conditions or other just inflammatory conditions. It differs from depression. Um, while there may be fatigue um, in depression, depression also has sadness, um, anhedonia, uh, self-deprecation and feelings of helplessness. And there's some, um, there's some schools of thought that think that peripheral fatigue um, may predate central fatigue. Um, so uh, peripheral inflammatory markers may predate um, inflammation of the brain, which may be related to depression um, and cognitive symptoms and myasthenia gravis and other autoimmune conditions. We don't know this for sure. It's just a hypothesis. All right, so now we're gonna talk about depression and anxiety. Uh, first, we'll talk about depression. Um, so um, to diagnose major depressive disorder, this is the um, DSM-5 um, uh, criteria. You have to have uh, five of the following symptoms and they have to have been present for a two week period and represent a change from previous function. And at least um, one of the symptoms is either depressed mood or lost interest. Um, so depressed for most of the day, markedly diminished interest or pleasure, weight loss, insomnia, psychomotor agitation or retardation, fatigue or loss of energy, feelings of worthlessness or excessive inappropriate guilt, diminished ability to think or concrete um, uh, or indecisiveness and recurrent thoughts of death or suicidal ideation. They cause um, significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, and other important areas of social functioning. And they're not attributed to um, physiological effects of a substance or to another medical condition. Um, and when we talk about depression and myasthenia gravis, obviously that can be um, difficult um, 
to parse uh, those two out. So, I mean, I'm not, I don't put, I don't invest everything into the DSM, <laughs> the DSM-5. Um, I don't necessarily agree. I think there's lots of overlap um, between psychiatric conditions and um, other conditions, um, especially neurological conditions, which is why I did the joint, um, the joint residency. Um, so, um, Anyway, so and then, and then there's no evidence of a manic episode or hypomanic episode, which would um, point more to a bipolar diagnosis. Uh, depression and myasthenia gravis um, is associated with increased disease severity, incidence of respiratory failure, um, unchanged status despite treatment. So people who get treatment for their myasthenia gravis and don't improve are more likely to be depressed. People in the earlier stages of disease are more likely to be depressed. People with older age of onset, um, people who are forced to make career changes um, because of their myasthenia gravis. Um, and interestingly, higher level of education, higher family income has been found to be associated with depression and myasthenia gravis. Not sure why that's the case. So if you have a patient um, in your neurology clinic, how would you um, determine if they're depressed? Uh, I, I believe here they might do PHQ2s and PHQ9s on every patient who comes in. So, um, so that, that, that's good. So there's a PHQ9, that's the patient health questionnaire. It has nine questions. It asks about the two previous um, weeks of depression symptoms, um, and it's Free, uh, so that's that's good. And then there's also the 21 question Bex depression inventory, which is commercially available. The Bex depression inventory may be better than the PHQ-9 because um, it may be able to better differentiate between depression symptoms um, and other uh, common complaints seen in myasthenia gravis, such as weakness. But PHQ-9 is easier to obtain and it's easier to administer. Um, if you have a patient who is depressed, um, you have a myasthenic patient who is depressed, how do you approach that patient? And if you're, if you're thinking about not referring them to a psychiatrist because it's just kind of standard depression, um, how would you manage that patient? And we all, most of us know that there's a long list of drugs um, in myasthenia gravis that we have to be very careful of that induce crisis and um, the significant respiratory symptoms. Um, so that's also the case you have to be careful with, uh, with psychiatric medications. Uh, so many antidepressants, it's important to know, have varying degrees um, of anticholinergic effects. Um, those include SSRIs, although less so than tricyclic antidepressants, and also um, less traditional um, uh, antidepressants such as Remeron. Paxil is the, uh, the SSRI that probably has the most anticholinergic effects. So if you wanted to treat a, one of your patients for depression, I'd probably avoid Paxil. Um, it could exacerbate uh, myasthenia gravis. And again, there's like not a lot of um, studies or data. This is all based on case reports, um, but just to be rather to be safe than sorry. Um, there's some evidence that Prozac um, is safe and effective. And then there was one open label study of 20 patients treated with Celexa over 12 weeks that showed improvement in depression, but, but did not show worsening of myasthenia gravis um, uh, symptoms. So Celexa, um, out of all of them, is probably safe um, and might be the best one to start with. Uh, tricyclic antidepressants such as Elevil, um, which I know neurologists like to also use for migraines and um, chronic pain and sleep um, should be avoided um, in myasthenia gravis because of the significant anticholinergic effects that can um, work at the um, acetylcholine receptor and worsen myasthenia patients. And ECT um, appears to be safe and effective um, for treatment of depression, but care must be taken again when um, deciding on which muscle relaxants to use and other anesthesia medications to use so that they, they're not going to at the um, acetylcholine receptor. All right, so now we're gonna talk about generalized anxiety disorder, um, which is also extremely common in myasthenia. And this is the DSM-5 um, diagnostic criteria. 
So generalized anxiety disorders characterized by uncontrollable and excessive worrying and anxiety for more days than not for at least six months. Um, and it's regarding several events and activities and it causes significant stress or impairment and anxiety and worry is out of proportion to the actual risk or likelihood of harm doing. Um, and the worries are more excessive. And three of the following symptoms must be present for diagnosis in adults. Um, restlessness, easily fatigued, difficulty concentrating, irritability, muscle, muscle tension, difficulty sleeping. Um, this, so that's the criteria for generalized anxiety disorder. There's also other conditions, um, which I just for the sake of time, I wasn't going to talk about that are, that are anxiety disorders. They're not generalized anxiety disorders, but can be really seen um, commonly in myasthenia gravis, like panic disorder has a 7% uh, prevalence. PTSD is another one. Um, social phobia um, is another one that sometimes comes up. Um, so just to keep in mind, this isn't like includes, it's, it's not all generalized anxiety disorders. There's a number of anxiety disorders you can see um, in my senior graphics. So um, anxiety in my senior gravis. Um, is um, found to be more significant and more prevalent in patients with bulbar symptoms. Um, and that's not surprising because the bulbar symptoms lead to dysarthria, dysphagia, dysphonia, um, and can lead to social anxiety from impaired uh, verbal and nonverbal communications. Um, also, not surprisingly, people with um, who have had respiratory failure and have been intubated um, have increased anxiety. Um, because um, this can be very unpredictable and people can go downhill um, quite quickly, which obviously is going to cause a lot of stress. And after an event like that, um, people are very concerned about their fluctuating symptoms and wary of what could happen um, in the future. And all of these things um, cause a need for excessive planning and avoidance of social situations um, um, to preserve muscle strength um, and avoid embarrassment. Um, that can, that can occur. These are, the, um, these are some anxiety um, screening tools that you could use in your, uh, in your clinic. I don't know if this one's used here. This is the Generalized Anxiety Disorder Scale 7. It asks about previous two weeks. It's seven questions. Um, and then you can also use the HADS A, which is the Hospital Anxiety and Depression Scale. That one's commercially available. So how would you treat anxiety um, or other uh, generalized anxiety or other anxiety disorders in myasthenia gravis? Um, like I said before, for the depression, you would have to be very, um, use caution with antidepressants like SSRIs. Um, TCA should be avoided. If you're gonna use an SSRI, uh, Selexa might be the safest one. Uh, using benzos um, in myasthenic patients, people with patients with myasthenia gravis, um, probably should be avoided um, both um, in patients who aren't actually in respiratory depress and depress, uh, aren't actually in respiratory distress and also in patients um, who are in respiratory distress um, because there's risks of over sedation. Um, but again, if you have a patient who is extremely anxious and you think that that anxiety is, you know, contributing to their respiratory distress, um, uh, and enhancing their myasthenia crisis, you could think about it. Um, and it all depends on um, the particular patient um, and the risks versus benefits. Um, diazepam uh, is a benzodiazepine that's very um, long acting um, and is one of the benzos that probably should be definitely avoided um, due to the risk of respiratory depression. So if you're going to use a benzo, you might want to choose something more um, short acting like Xanax. Um, and gabapentin, um, this I this is interesting. I'm not, and I I don't know. I think there've been case reports that gabapentin can rarely worsen um, myasthenia gravis, and sometimes you use it to treat anxiety. And there's rat studies that show that there's a decremental response uh, with nurse stimulation when um, the rats are given gabapentin. So I'm not sure what the mechanism of that is. Maybe like um, um, I'm guessing um, like a change in 
tone of the different neurotransmitters um, in the brain. GABA is increased, maybe a CD choline drops, I'm not sure. Okay, so bipolar disorder. Um, bipolar disorder uh, is, I don't, I, I don't think bipolar disorder is uh, found to be more prevalent in my senior patients. It is found to be more prevalent in MS patients. Um, but I wanted to mention it um, just because of, it's something to be aware of um, and you have to think about how you're gonna treat your patients if they also have myasthenia and gravis. Um, so if someone has bipolar disorder and they're presenting to you uh, with um, symptoms, it's probably gonna be um, hypomania or manic symptoms. And that involves um, at least four consecutive days um, uh, inflated self-esteem, decreased need for sleep, increased talkativeness, raising thought, being distracted, um, increased goal-directed activity, um, engaging in activities that hold the potential for painful consequences. Um, someone might also present with um, bipolar depression, um, which basically is just, it's just like depression, except they've had an episode of mania in the past. So um, instead of just diagnosing them with a major depressive disorder, you would diagnose them with bipolar depression. Um, and that distinction, it, I don't want to get too like specific, but that distinction is important because if you think someone has bipolar depression versus a uh, major depressive disorder, you wouldn't want to treat them um, with an SSRI. You, wanted, you would want to treat them with a mood stabilizer because SSRIs can induce, um, can induce mania, which is not good. Um, if you think someone has bipolar disorder, you're not sure, there's a really good uh, questionnaire that you can just get online. It's called Mood Disorder Questionnaire, and it goes through uh, a lot of um, different symptoms. It asks about specific things the patient may or may not have done, how they may or may not have felt. Um, I find it really helpful if you're not sure. And then for treating bipolar disorder in patients um, with myasthenia gravis, Interestingly, lithium um, has been found to induce um, a new onset myasthenia gravis. Not sure of the mechanism. It may be due to downregulation of acetylcholine receptors. Um, and lithium also can um, induce um, weakness. So that's, that's, that's it just in the general population. Um, and lithium also can't be used um, it, or it shouldn't be used when someone's getting ECT because um, it can cause confusion. So maybe it does um, It does have that activity at the um, acetylcholine receptors. So the decreased activity of acetylcholine receptors can lead to confusion and memory um, concerns. Um, Depico and Tegretol, however, those um, may be safe, but it's, we don't know for sure. But lithium should be avoided. And then finally, we'll talk about psychosis. Um, and how to treat psychosis in patients with myasthenia gravis. Psychosis is a general term. There are many different, psychosis can be associated with many different conditions um, in psychiatry. So schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, bipolar disorder. Um, so yeah, or, so um, it's not meant to be, um, when you screen for psychosis, you're not necessarily um, trying to hone in on a particular diagnosis, but if someone has those symptoms, you you would want to treat them specifically um, with an antipsychotic because other medications generally don't really help. So you can ask your patient, do you see or hear things that others cannot? Do you feel as though you're being followed or watched or that someone is playing with your mind? Um, and that's kind of a good way to approach uh, uh, patients who may or may not have psychotic symptoms. Um, so how would you treat it? Um, this is um, important to know. Antipsychotics also can unmask myasthenia gravis um, symptoms. Again, likely due to anticholinergic effects, um, similar to SSRIs um, and TCAs. Um, although the anticholinergic effects um, of antipsychotics are mostly at the muscarinic receptors, many have some activity at the nicotinic receptors as well. Um, and interestingly, and this has to do with um, the blepharotosis, um, there are case reports of um, someone with schizophrenia being treated with Risperdal. Um, and actually, there's, there's uh, increased risk of having schizophrenia and, and, myasthenic, and, my, and myasthenic patients, which we don't know why. 
um, anyways, um, Risperdal given to patients, um, and then they noticed that they had um, drooping eyelids, um, and that was thought to be an extrapyramidal symptom, thought to be a side effect of, um, of the Risperdal. So then they were given cogentin, which obviously has like a lot of anticholinergic effects, and then that induced um, my uh, respiratory failure um, and the patient with schizophrenia. Um, so if you need to, if it's psychosis, um, you know, if someone's pleasantly psychotic um, and it's not interfering with their life and they have myasthenia gravis, you, you may not want to use an antipsychotic. Um, if they, um, but if they're interfering with, the psychosis can be very detrimental. So if it's interfering with their life or causing dangerous behavior or distress, which that's usually the case, um, you would need to use, try to use some sort of um, antipsychotic and you would go slow. Go low, start low and go slow. And, um, Stay away from that and go and <laughs> um, These, this is a chart of um, anticholinergic um, effects of the different antipsychotics. So they're not all equal. Um, Clozapine has a lot of anticholinergic effects. So you definitely wouldn't want to use that. Chlorpromazine does as well. Haldol, um, and I believe uh, uh, Abilify as well, safe. Lorazidone safe. So there are a number of, of ones that you can choose um, that you know you, you would probably want to start with. Um, but you would want to avoid clozapine, probably ketiapine, um, chlorpromazine, olanzapine, which those are the more sedating antipsychotics too. So they're probably sedating because they have anticholinergic effects. Um, so that makes sense. Uh, and then uh, a, a, a slide on uh, psychiatric side effects of the different um, treatments for myasthenia gravis. There um, doesn't seem to be too many psychiatric side effects with treatments um, like IVIG, uh, plasmapheresis, and the more targeted um, biologics. But steroids um, definitely uh, can induce uh, psychiatric symptoms. So. If you're treating someone with steroids, um, it's good to be aware of things that might um, come up. Um, Short-term use of steroids um, can induce or unmask bipolar disorder or uh, um, just induce mania in someone without bipolar disorder. Um, and also can lead to anxiety. And then higher dose um, prednisolone um, in a study was independently associated with worsening depression in myasthenia gravis patients. Um, so that was 8.1 milligrams versus 4.1 milligrams. Um, so that supports evidence that long-term use of ster ster steroids can definitely induce depression. Um, and if you're gonna use steroids, um, if you can use lower doses, I mean, I think that would be um, desirable anyways, um, that, would, that would be better. Okay, so some take home points. Um, treating the disease, treating depression and anxiety and improving social support and improving uh, self-acceptance of the disease are all gonna improve the health um, related quality of life in patients with myasthenia gravis. Uh, myasthenia gravis may be more challenging um, from a psychosocial standpoint um, compared to other neurological conditions or other chronic diseases due to the fluctuating and um, often you know, un invisible symptoms um, leading to lack of understanding um, by the social environment, which can also contribute to um, mood issues and anxiety issues. Uh, monitor depression in patients on steroids and use the lowest possible dose. Um, and more research is needed on the safety and tolerability of psychoactive drugs. Um, and when choosing medications um, to treat psychiatric conditions, be very mindful of the anticholinergic properties. So when to refer to a psychiatrist, uh, any dep depressive episode associated with suicidal ideation, um, any major depressive disorder with psychotic features, any major depressive disorder or anxiety disorder that hasn't responded to an SSRI, any bipolar disorder, any psychotic disorder. And I would hope that the psychiatrist would know that the patient has myasthenia gravis and which um, medications to use. Uh, and then this is, uh, I put this um, on, this is, these are the legal forms to use 
um, in, in Hawaii, if you see someone in clinic and they're, um, you feel that they're dangerous um, to themselves or others. Um, I, I don't think I'm gonna go through it. If you wanna take a picture of it, it's, it's good information to have. So say you're in clinic and someone says they're suicidal, how do you, how do you deal with that? Um, so there are a number of different forms you can use. You can, um, you can call 911 and the police will file an MH1 uh, or the police will go evaluate the patient and they will, the, the patient and they will file an MH1 if they think that it's necessary. Um, and then that'll bring the patient to the ED for a psych eval basically against their will if necessary. Um, but the caveat to this form is the police use their judgment on whether to file the MH1. So they may or may not agree with your concern. Um, MH2 is a form that you can just Google it. Any physician can file. And MH2 is also called an oral ex parte, and that can be done for medical or psych. Reasons. So if you're really concerned about a patient and they're out in the community and you think they're going to die for medical reasons or psych reasons, you can um, you can do this. And you basically um, there's a number that you call. Um, there's a form you have to figure out that you have to fill out that explains why you think the, the patient's in imminent danger, and then there'll basically be a court order for police to bring that patient to the hospital if they're found in the community. It takes like at least 24 hours though. Um, so that's the drawback to the MH2. And then the MH4, any physician can file in a clinic. Um, but unfortunately, most clinicians other than psychiatrists don't know how to do this. Um, so but what you would do is you would call 911, you would download the um, MH4 from the website, from Google, fill it out and give it to the police. And the benefit about this one even though you have to fill out the form, um, the police must bring the patient to the ED. It's not like the MH1 where the police get to use um, their judgment. So just, just FYI, if you ever run into that, or you can call a psychiatrist, you know, and ask them. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Questions? Thank you, great lecture. I have, a, I have a question, actually, as I was talking about anxiety, it's, it's, uh, it brought to my mind a phenomena that is being recognized in epilepsy over the past year, the anticipatory anxiety, mm -hmm. which is like a specific phobia, essentially, mm -hmm. in the five for patients. So the parents of school patients are overly concerned, obviously, or just mm -hmm. ruminating about it. Mm -hmm. Is this something that come up that come up in in my ischemia with the age of patients and patients being the patients have those sort of dramatic events going to the point of I mean yeah I think there I think it's pretty it's not uncommon for if you've had respiratory failure before um, especially if you have developed an anxiety disorder that if you you know if you start feeling anxious it can worsen. Um, the myasthenic crisis or the respiratory failure. I don't know. I mean, we don't know, you know, the biological mechanisms of that. I mean, I believe the brain and the body are connected, obviously. Um, and in epilepsy, have they found EEG changes? That they so these are actually patients who, for whatever reason, develop at the right circumstances, develop this extreme phobia of having another seizure. And then they, they've been found to actually have. No, no, they basically go to extremes to oh, prevent okay. that seizure. So okay. it's almost like they don't leave their they house. They don't leave their house. Yeah. They're, they're changed their whole life mm -hmm. because of the yeah. fear of having another seizure. And then yeah. anything that they think could trigger a seizure, they avoid it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that definitely happens um, from what I've read in patients with medicine. Like that. And that leads to their poor quality of life. Um, Questions? Some students are probably wondering about your, uh, you may have shared this um, January about your path to uh, psychiatry and neurology. Uh, uh, how many of you think that psychiatry and neurology is a very interesting path to, to take? Uh, I see a lot of hate not Julia <laughs> back there who's, a, who's our senior a medical student. Uh, would you mind sharing how did you get into both psychiatry and neurology and, and um, 
and then it sounds like you you leading practicing more psychiatry and how, how did that these happen? days yeah, yeah these days i'm practicing more psychiatry um so basically i was lucky um i had uh, so there's a five or six pro five or six neuro combined neuropsychiatry programs um in the country um and there's actually a lot of um, combined programs for people who don't know. There's psychiatry and medicine, um, there's family medicine and psychiatry, there's um, peds and child psychiatry. So there's a number of them. Like um, if you want to do something integrative, the residency is longer. Um, I didn't know about neuropsychiatry, um, but I was always interested um, in both, but I, I wasn't sure which one to choose because neurology seemed, no offense, it seems... <laughs> Without psychiatry, it seems a little like rigid, I guess. <laughs> yeah, which it actually isn't. It's not rigid at all. Um, you heard that joke. If you put three neurologists in the room, they will all disagree on this. Stuff. It's the three of us, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what I thought at the time. Um, and then psychiatry um, seemed a little too fuzzy. For me, and that's actually not really true of psychiatry anymore either. There's a lot of there's been a lot of um, work done in psychiatry to make it less fuzzy. Um, so I wasn't sure, but I like both. Um, and I, when one of my um, my mentor did a lecture in medical school, and I found out that he gave a lecture on OCD and um, neuropsychiatry, and I was fascinated, and I contacted him, um, and I did a rotation, and um, that was that was it. I just decided I just decided to do it. I think. One thing, when I was on my neuropsychiatry rotation, um, I was reading textbooks like late at night and early in the morning on neuropsychiatry. And I was like so fascinated by it. And so I think that that, I may have already said this to Julia, who's rotating up with me now on CL. Um, but um, if, you, if you think you're gonna do something, pick up a textbook or pick up the papers. And if you, you're really excited about it, that's probably good for you. Um, and I didn't really get that. I mean, I got that from psychiatry alone and neurology alone, but the combination really excited me. It's six years. The first year is medicine, mostly with a little bit of psychiatry. The next two years are psychiatry, and then the next two years are neurology. Um, and then the final year is a combination, and we support the both. What do you see um, as a neuro neurologist, a psychiatrist? Um, uh, what what perspective that you can bring uh, that that would be very valuable for the patient? That I, I mean, let's say if mm -hmm. Dr. Gorex sees a patient as a neurologist and Dr. Guerrero sees a patient as a psychiatrist, something that we might miss, but somebody like you would pick it up. Yeah. Um. So we get patients. Um. We tell us our inpatient unit. Um. Our inpatient psych unit. Um. And uh we get a lot of people coming with psychosis and mania and other behavioral problems and changes in personality um and lots of times if that uh, oh well, they have schizophrenia or they have bipolar disorder it's obvious you know and and as soon as they're seen in the ed um they're directed to Catella um, because they're they're a psych patient um so but um a lot of um neurological conditions um, especially like encephalitis, um, it can present with um, with psychiatric symptoms. Epilepsy can present with psychiatric symptoms. Um, so, uh, uh, so, so sometimes those patients end up on Tequila, um, which can be pretty scary. So we've had some of those um, for sure. And they have like a different flavor to them, I guess. Um, and, and there's always like negative family history, Often for psych for psychiatric or for psychiatric conditions, which is always a red flag. Um, no drugs involved. Um, no history of um, no psychiatric history. Um, maybe an older age onset. Um, for encephalitis, one of the big ones is do they have an autoimmune condition like eczema or lupus? Um, then you really want to start thinking about. Um, for uh, about um, more neurological causes of the psychiatric symptoms. Um, and a lot of, they, they get like mixed, a lot of neurologists will say, oh, it's psych, and a lot of psych will say, and then they don't want it, they don't, they're afraid of the patient because it's psych, and then the, the psychiatrists do it the same thing. You know, if any patient has a neurological condition or a neurological symptom, 
um, psychiatrists kind of get nervous about it and pull away. Um, and so those patients kind of get left um, in the middle, I guess. Um, so that's, I like that. I like being able to help those patients. You bridge the gap. Mm -hmm. Just out of curiosity, how many of you are a site major or doing something uh, in, in psychology or uh, this out of, okay? That, that's right, Anna is in grad school, uh, okay? And, um, and Violet, uh, you are site tech, right? What's that? Behavioral analyst. Right? And uh, do you have any advice for uh, students or interns that may want to consider this path? What 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 should they be? Uh, what what kind of projects? What should they pursue that would uh, really uh, you know launch them off? Do you have any advice for the students or interns? Uh, so I mean I think there's a lot of opportunities here. Um, you're of doing, course, of course. Yeah. No, I mean really. I mean you're doing a number. You're doing the research on um, on the Vegas Nerve Simulator and depression and TBI um, and depression. Those are the two projects that that we're working on right now. And I think there's others. I think there are other EEG projects looking at functional or uh, non-epileptic seizures. So all those things, um, those would be really good to get involved in. Yeah. And then you would want to do an away rotation, uh, probably at, um, at, a, at a program or two. Um, find out, you know, which ones you can do that at and do it early. Okay. Are you talking about program with combined mm -hmm. side and do If that's what you wanted to do. Yeah. You guys need to get in touch with Dr. Abraham. Yeah. Let, let me, I, I could connect you guys. Um, yeah, no, thank you to, to the faculty for you know, Dr. Abramowitz is heading the neuromodulation project on vagal nerve stimulator, looking at depression and epilepsy patients. Uh, and thank you to the faculty for willing to mentor the students. Um, okay, this is them, the two weeks. Um, so, any other questions for Dr. Abramowitz? Okay, thank you. Uh, let's do the, okay, um, does anybody know Dr. Burgess is here yet? Uh, I don't know. Kim, do you know if he's here yet? Okay. So maybe what we'll do is um, we'll take a break. Uh, I think we can take an early break and then we will, um, may we start a little bit early? I think once Dr. Burgess is here, uh, we would like to gather our view. Can you guys don't go very far away? Uh, just stay around here in the courtyard, and uh, if you need to go to the restroom, it's over here. There's some breakfast, some kind of like brunch for you guys out there. Uh, thanks to uh, 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 Jana for sponsoring lunch. She's sitting over there. Uh, this uh, one of the sponsors. Uh, she's 